Hey, this is Vu, and today I'm going to take a look at 10 more tips to improve at CS. And just like last time, I've got the links in the description to the full dedicated videos on these topics if you want to go more in depth. But the first thing to look at here is something most people know, but if you didn't, you're going to have your mind blown here. It's Peeker's Advantage. And Peeker's Advantage is that due to ping and net coding of a game, you're going to literally see your opponent before they see you. And that means the way you play CS can be quite different than the way you would if Peeker's Advantage didn't exist. If someone is holding an angle without any other advantage with a rifle instead of an op, because with an op, they're just gonna see motion and shoot instantly. It's not as noticeable, but if they're holding an angle with a rifle and you peek out right into them decisively peek into them looking at their head stop and realize they're there shoot them instantly you will get the kill nine times out of ten peeker's advantage especially as ping gets higher and higher with online cs is very noticeable and the way you play would be very different if there was no such thing as peeker's advantage Next up is angle isolation, and this is very important in a variety of different contexts. However, the base idea is you want to only be exposed to one angle at a time if you can at all help it. And this can be very relevant when you're attacking a site or defending it, depending on the situation, but it is part of the concept behind why entry frag routes are a certain way. For example, if you see someone attacking upper here from squeaky, you will often see them stray very wide on the bomb site and then come up along this line. While this isn't necessarily optimal, you're sitting yourself in the middle of the open for this player to peek out on you. What you are doing is you're making sure that if this player from mini peeks out, he would have to be all the way over here, crossing by very dangerous angles to clear clear you out and your teammates thereby would very likely be able to trade quickly because he's in the middle of the open so you're trying to isolate mini so that you can focus on the bomb site this is even more relevant when you have the player that is behind the silo he's trying to make sure that he can peek towards hut clear that out he's not vulnerable to any other angles then he comes to the other side and peeks out mini doing the same instead of peeking out hut and then going wide and peeking out mini occasionally this could be relevant but more often than not he's not doing that because here he's trying to clear mini while exposed from hut this can get even more complex in a situation where a ct might be in a 1v2 and a terrorist is wrapping around the side here trying to catch him in the flank this player on the bomb site might be aware of that, and instead of holding the angle, he may actually opt to do something like this, where he pushes forward, trying to catch the player that might be mini or might be squeaky, who's thinking the bomb site is clear because the CT is being sneaky. He thinks the site is clear. This CT catches that player off guard and then spins back around and grabs himself a free kill. He's isolating that angle from the player in the middle of the bomb site, catching the other player off guard, and then turning back and getting the kill again. So he's making sure to utilize this concept to the best of his ability. Next up is trying to make utility work for yourself. Obviously, it's not going to be as effective as a teammate posting up and throwing a pop flash for you if you try to throw one for yourself. However, you need to be able to make sure that you can do things on your own without your pug teammates who will never throw a good flash for you and will often just say no needing to be involved. So there's a couple of styles of flashes you can try and throw. You can try to get good at something like right clicking flashes that end up in the right spot that are kind of pop flashes if you get really good at it they can be pretty close to pop flashes the only problem is you're going to be closer and thereby they will often hear the flash as it leaves your hand if they're really listening but in pugs that's usually not the case so right clicking flashes high is one big one the other one i recommend is throwing flashes that land and hang in front of your opponents this is something that works much better as you go down the ranks but at any rank in matchmaking people are going to see a flash run in front of them and they're going to turn around immediately you can shoot them in the back this is a very basic concept that will catch people off guard pretty consistently and works incredibly well when you're in a tight spot 
We say that was tip three. This is kind of tip three and a half, and this is to understand support flashes. Support flashes are flashes you can throw that will not blind your teammates, but will blind your opponents. I mentioned this in the last 10 tips video, but I thought I would actually give some examples of what they look like, and it's not always landing behind your teammates. So a flash for A that is a support flash is a flash that would land up over top of triple. And if you look at where these ones blow up, they blow up high enough that it wouldn't blind a player under balcony even if he's looking out towards the bomb site however anybody running into the bomb site is going to be blinded and that means this player can either be playing out like this it'll land behind him or he can even be playing back in here and again it will not be low enough to blind him either and this is a flash that you can throw from almost anywhere you can throw it from catwalk like i did there you can throw it up over from window you can even throw it as you're rotating out of b Next up is to make plays for your teammates. This isn't always the solution, but very often you'll get into spots late round where you'll have quite a bit of utility and your teammates might have almost none. And instead of waiting for your teammate to realize you have that utility and ask for a nade, especially because they might not ever realize you have utility, sometimes the best thing you can do is suggest things to your teammates or tell them you're going to do something for them. For example, if you're B here late round and you want to get some info on banana, you can tell your teammate that you're going to flash for them on banana instead of asking or instead of waiting for them to ask, you suggest it to them. And if they don't want to do it, they can say no. However, if they thought the idea was good, if they wanted to make the play, they can just roll with it. And you've essentially given your team a play that they otherwise might not have realized or taken a very long time to do. This goes hand in hand with decisiveness. Really, decisiveness is one of the most underrated but important aspects of being good at CS or really any game in general. If you're halfway between two good plays, you will have made a bad play, and oftentimes a decisively made bad play is much better than an indecisively made good play. That means that when you're in a situation, just play it out as well as you can with the original idea in mind instead of constantly changing the way you're trying to play. That doesn't mean you can't react to the way your opponents are playing and you can't make changes mid round, but if your goal in a certain situation is to get aggressive and you commit to it, deciding in that moment that you want to get passive will often just get you killed. When you go for a play, when you go for an idea in a round, commit to it and evaluate afterwards whether that was the right idea, whether you could have done it better, instead of flip-flopping between different ideas and putting yourself in a terrible spot. Next up is winning from a disadvantage, and oftentimes this is really about understanding a disadvantage and understanding that if you are in a disadvantage, it is worth it to take risks. If you're in something like a 3v5 and you're the IV player and you don't really know where your opponents are, oftentimes it's worth it to do something very risky like pushing out IV and looking for information down this angle here. Or if you're somewhere like six lane here, green train, whatever you call it, and you're in a 3v5, oftentimes walking, pushing up towards TCON might be a very effective thing to do as well. These are things that are highly risky, but high risk and high reward often go hand in hand. And in 3v5s, it's really actually low risk, high reward. Because if you lose the round, if you die and the play goes wrong, you're not giving away a free kill in quite the same way that you would be in a 5v5. If you die, you were already going to be losing the round anyways. If a standard round plays out from a 3v5, you should be losing it much more often than you don't. However, if the play goes very well, if everything goes to plan, the reward is that you're now back into the round. If you push up into TCON here and find out that nobody's outside, you can have your team double up on B, you can quick rotate yourself, and maybe you have a decent hold. Or if you are in here and you get into a nice little off angle, you hold it, you catch a couple of kills, you can put your team into something like a 2v2 later on that is also winnable as well because you made what is typically a high risk, high reward play in a spot where worst case scenario, you were losing the round anyways. The next thing to realize is that trade fragging is very important and baiting isn't always bad. 
Very often you see people complain about baiters. However, if you're baiting to get a trade kill, this is actually what you want to be doing. You don't want to be stacked up five players all right on each other's asses, making your way into an angle because then someone can be in a certain spot somewhere like top of the train here and spray you down or the first player can get killed and he can't relay that information back quite in time for the second player to act off of it. However, if you have decent spacing, for example, if you're somewhere like here near the middle or top of the ramp and your teammate is just coming out, that gives you the spacing where you catch your opponent, he gets spotted out, he gets the first kill, which is what you're expecting. However, you can quickly trade. What you want to be doing is you want to catch the player where he's just got the kill, he stopped shooting, and you peek out before his gun is then accurate again. Because there's a small cooldown, right, right after you spray, where you, if you start spraying again, you're not going to be shooting on target. If you can catch that timing, that is perfect spacing and that is perfect trade fragging. You allow the information from the initial player to be relayed back, you give yourself time, you peek out, grab the kill, get the trade, and give yourself an advantage on a map where it is generally quite CT sided. Next up is that working picks and defaulting are not the same thing. They may often look the same, however, the intent and the goal involved is very different. When you're working picks, you're trying to find kills and you're going aggressive, you're taking risks in order to find angles that you can get a gunfight and you can potentially grab a kill. When you're playing against coordinated opponents, oftentimes this gets you killed much more often than it gets you frags because they're going to be playing angles where they have an advantage, playing together, bait and switching, pop flashing, things like that. However, running a default is Again, looking very similar, but the goal is different. Instead of looking for kills and overextending to look for gunfights, you're looking for map control. You're looking to get control of certain important areas and kills may come as a consequence. The CTs obviously don't want to give up something like mid for free more often than not, which means you will get into gunfights and you may or may not get kills in the meantime. But the goal there is to get that map control and use the map control you've gained to put yourself in an advantageous situation and play out the round from there. Perhaps you get into something like a 4v4. They have to rotate a player off of B to worry about the mid pick or the mid push. And because of that, you can work your way back around and try and do something like a four man B explode where you do something like Molly off site and smoke CT. And you try to overwhelm that player that no longer has support because they're worried about extra angles. So while oftentimes in pugs you are just working for picks, it's important to realize that these two concepts are not the same. Next up is to understand that your goal oftentimes, if you're IGLing or lurking especially, but just in general, your goal is very often to catch your opponents in transition. That means you're trying to put your opponents in spots that they're not ready for you to show up so you can catch them off guard and get the easiest kills possible. I say this is very important when you're IGLing or lurking because that's when it's most obvious that this concept is at work. For example, if you have a player on Dust2 on this CT side that is playing the rotator position, playing from elevator over to mid. So you have something like a 3 1 1, except you have, you know, a B side mid player and a CT side mid player. This is very common if you're playing competitively. Your goal as an IGL is to draw this player over to this A side and hit out mid or to draw this player over to the B side and hit out A. That way they're lacking that one extra player that could make the difference in the bomb site hold. This is also very relevant when you're looking at lurkers. If you're lurking, you're generally not trying to just take a straight up gunfight. You're trying to catch this player that was holding this angle for 30 seconds. Finally, he starts to rotate off because he wants to support his player on A and and there you are for the kill. You just peek out and grab the freebie because he's not ready for it. He is in transition. And this can be extrapolated to many different situations, to many different spots and angles. But the idea is that it is very easy to kill people if they're not expecting it. So you catch them when they're just about to move away, when they're just about to do something different before they can set up. Oftentimes people will be ready for something to happen, ready for a push or whatever. They'll transition into a different spot where again, they are ready for something to happen. But if you catch 
catch them in the middle there, it's easy to get kills and it's easy to win rounds. The next thing to talk about is to be like water, my friends. You don't want to be overly rigid, and this is in all aspects of CS, but especially when you're looking at roles. Very often people will call themselves an entry fragger or a support player or a lurker, and they're going to constantly only put themselves in positions they think that role should be in. If they're a lurker, they're going to be trying to go long A, tell their team to go B, and they can work out and try and catch their opponent off guard and grab a free kill. You need to make sure that you are always fluid in the way you are playing and the roles you are fulfilling. That means if you are a lurker, that doesn't mean at the beginning of the round you always go into spots where you are lurking. That often means that you're one of two players on the outskirts of the map. You may have a long side player here towards the doors, and you may have a player that plays inside of tunnels. Each of these players is potentially the lurker depending on how the round plays out. If the round plays out that you want to go for a B split, this long player may very well become the lurker player. He may well stay long and try and catch people off guard or draw rotates. However, if you end up going towards A, if you want to do an A split, this player isn't going to run over to B and become the lurker. No, this player is now a part of the play. He's going to be an entry fragger or a support player making the site take work and that player on the other side of the map is going to be the lurker. So don't be overly rigid when you think you have a role, when you think you play a certain way, make sure you can adjust it based on what is called for. Anyways, thanks for watching and I hope this helped. If you enjoyed the content, take a look at the Patreon, take a look at my Discord, my second channel, and hit that sub button, hit the like button, follow the channel, support the content, catch you next time.